Hello, everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Hey, everybody. It's Rado. Hey, and we're back, and this is episode three, if you're keeping track of numbers, but I've stopped doing numbers on a lot of my shows because it it's kind of a weird thing. You People feel a little put off by numbers. Um, like, if I'm look, listening to a, kick, a podcast and they're like, this is episode 236, I'm like, ah, I don't want to start there. Oh, you mean, oh, the uh, the problem comic books have, where they're constantly having to, hey, it's the all-new Amazing Spider-Man number one. Forget about the previous 732, And but as a longtime fan, like, how dare you? This is issue 733. I refuse to accept that it's the new number one. Well, actually, Marvel did something interesting where they put point one after some of yeah. their stuff. And so if you if you are never understood what that means, like it's issue 77.1, that's a good jumping on point. Are they still doing that, though? Because surely that just caused more confusion than anything else. I don't think it causes confusion unless you don't know. If you don't know what it means, whatever. You just read the issue. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not like Marvel's an easy read anyway. Mm, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm i a huge Marvel fan. I read a ton of comics. And even I'll stop to go, huh? <laughs> and then I start cross. I found that I enjoy Marvel more if I just pick a series and just read through that one series. Yeah. Consistently. Yep. I Any- used to be really into it. Oh, no, but we're not here to talk about comic books, are we? No. Well, we might be at some point. I'm sure that will show up as a top uh, a top five at some point. Although I'm ready today's, for- today's top five has got to be about games. we got to do something about games. Well, anyhow, uh, this is not the only live thing you're doing today. That is correct. Uh, in case folks would like to watch me uh, put on my spandex, right after Tom and I are done at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time, you will be able to find me on Paul Grogan's Gaming Rules YouTube channel, where he and I will be taking on the Green Goblin. I will be, of course, Captain America, and he will be Thor. And we will see how well we do. You can find that, I believe, if you go to marvel.rado.com. I set up a URL for it, so you don't have to go searching for it online. And uh, come along. It should be good fun. I, you know, uh, Marvel Champions was my number two game of last year, and I will take any excuse I can to play it. Yeah, the, uh, how are, are you slightly thrown off, though, by the distribution of the packs? Like, me and Roy are having a hard time getting them. Oh? Well, literally tracking them down, you mean? I I don't even have the Thor pack. I I just wasn't able to get it. Um, Yep. And the the stores where I bought it were out instantly. Roy finally managed to find one online, and I gave up. So I went to Covenant, uh, which is a a game store, and they sell online slightly. They're a big game store near uh, Fantasy Flight. And they have a subscription model, so I subscribed because I, I said I can't, yeah. I can't keep worrying about this. Yeah, my my history was I played the original game last year, loved it, had to move on to new things. Then I go to your convention, Dice Tower West, oh, he's where <laughs> where you put Miss Marvel and the Green Goblin stuff in your library copies. I'm like, oh, I gotta try it, and then I just got rehooked. And so as soon as I get home, I start searching. I was just going to let it go. I was just going to let it go, Tom. I didn't need to go down this rabbit hole, but you were the dealer. You got me hooked. And so next thing, I find myself on Italian online game stores ordering them to ship them overseas. That's how I got my stuff from Italy. It is very hard to find, though. So yeah. um, you should wait till you see the next time. I, I got some stuff from Etsy uh, to enhance oh. the game. And uh-huh. there are some amazing uh, ac- acrylic etched counters. Roy did a little review of them on Board Game Breakfast a yeah. few weeks ago. They're really... Oh, you mean really... those trays that holds everything all in one and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. That, there's trays, but there's also really nice tokens, and it just adds a really cool flair to the game. So uh, you can look it up on Etsy, folks. There's a lot of stuff for it on Etsy, but I will tell you this. Ain't cheap. Ain't cheap at all. <laughs> Alrighty, so okay. folks, we're going to get started. The first segment we do each time here is a new game mechanism. So today's game mechanism is the next one alphabetically, and I need to switch to the screen here. Action cue. Yes, which is not what I think most people call this mechanism at all. I don't think I've ever called it an action cue, and no. I especially haven't done it. It says here, you create an action cue and perform it in sequences. There's a batch cue where you do them in, in sequence, or rolling cues, where you add it to the end of the cue, and then the first action is then executed. 
Yeah. It's, I call it what it calls out at the bottom, program movement. Mm -hmm. um, although that says an action queue that's for only movement actions is called program movement. And that's a separate mechanism entry. But I would argue that. They do that, have that as a separate? Oh, my gosh, they do. All right. But isn't that weird? Because I, I guess, to me, action queue is a subset of program movement. Because, yes, in, in games where you do these things, there are times where you don't move at all. You shoot or whatever you know, you're doing. Or you pick up a, a cube. I, I wouldn't then say, well, that's not program movement. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I mean, I just refer to these as programming games. You know, I mean, and I love it. Uh, you know, programming, uh, uh, programming mechanism where I don't just, oh, it's my turn. I'll choose what action or what two actions or whatever I'll do. I have to choose up front, this is what my character is going to do. He's going to do this, then this, then this, then this. Man, I hope that works. You're usually doing the same thing at the same time, whether we're competitive or cooperative, and then everybody reveals, and then we run those programs, and everything falls apart inevitably, and it all goes horribly wrong, and I love it. I think this is actually a fairly divisive mechanism. Really? Well, I like it too. But if you're someone who likes perfect planning, you can be really mm -hmm. mind just irritated at these because you make your quote unquote perfect plan and then it's messed up by a random event or not necessarily a random event by something another player does. Sam Healy. Exactly. Yeah. Always hate it. You know, the, the, the number one game that people th I think of and we still use as kind of the, the point for this is Robo Rally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he hated Robo Rally because he would make this perfectly thing. He would have it done, and then I would move and push his robot out of the way. And then that would ruin the rest of his action programming. Also known as, that's where the fun begins. Well, I, I, I don't disagree with you on this one very small point. Um, but, <laughs> got to keep the... So uh, Sam was wrong, and we shall not speak of him again. <laughs> He's banished. I Hang want on, him me... off your channel for having uh, said... Oh, wait. Never mind. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> so let's go look at some of the games that have us here yeah. with. Now, I'm a little confused here by some of these. The first one is Robinson Crusoe Actions on the Cursed Island. You're sorting once again by um, ownership, the, right? The Oh, I put the number of ratings. I guess an ownership would make more sense. Okay. Well, whichever way you like. Uh, I do, it's your show today. It's still the number one. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. sure. I don't think Robinson Crusoe fits in this. No. Well, um, well wait a minute. I, okay, I, I have to admit, I haven't played this game for years. It's a worker placement game when it boils right down to it. It is. You have those events that come out. And, do and you then, resolve? But you don't resolve the workers when you place, right? You place all the workers and then you resolve everything? It's been so long. Okay, I'm trying to think now. Um, yeah. You, Even still, if that's the case, I would say that is at best tangential to action programming. Uh, because really, the whole point of programming is I have to program. I have to program out a sequence of events by myself. If you and I are collaboratively programming, okay, well, I'll program step one, and then you'll program step two. Yeah, I suppose we're still programming, but it's. I, I think that gets too far afield from the entire point. I mean, Robinson Crusoe is a cool game, but it's just a cooperative worker placement, which is a I, unique thing in and of itself. I do but, yeah, not disagree. I, 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 I say nay to the Board Game Geek, and in fact, I'm going to do it right now. I am going to edit it because BGG <laughs> is a public database. Edit. And while I'm doing right. it, you can go on to the next one because I think well, we agree. I, this ain't I, right. I think the next one you're going to disagree with too, and that's Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures game. No, I, I, I think that's actually a really good, a really unique example of it. And quite frankly, those dials are by far the coolest thing about that game. Easily. No, no, I don't disagree with that, but that dial is not a cue. It's a single action you pick. <sighs> so, are you suggesting that for it to be a programming game, I have to um, input at least two actions into my program? Yes, because otherwise it's just simultaneous selection. <sighs> oh, you're right. Okay, now listen. Oh, the, you're right. The original, like wings, the original Wings of Glory, which okay. uh, X-Wing was based on, was World yeah. War I. And in that one, you had to program your more than one action in a row. Really? because. Because the World War I airplanes didn't have that great of maneuverability. So you'd say, I'm going to go here, then turn here. And then you, would always, you were always putting one, one ahead. So players so that, had the equivalent of multiple dials in that game. Yeah, you used cards instead. Yeah. Okay. And then the, you put the card on the table and they followed it. I actually think X-Wing's an improvement on the original one. but Because they're simplifying it, streamlining it for a newer audience. And I would think you're right. I, I think you're right. It's, it, 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 it's simultaneous action selection. It is not programming. 
And the definer is got to have at least two entries. You know what I'm doing. I'm editing it. <laughs> Tom, you and I, we're going to fix Board Game Geek one topic at a time here. Okay, I'm, I'm currently working on another series of uh, videos where I'm going through the database. And there's a lot of games. This may take a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Colt Express. So in hmm. Colt Express, you're running around a train, you're punching people, you're definitely putting cards down on a shared pile, and then when these come up, uh, you, you're taking different actions, punching and jumping and moving and stuff. This one definitely uh, it fits in this category. Oh, yeah, totally. I would say so. As and does, of course, the next one, Robo Rally, which is the granddaddy. Not the first. Oh, what was the first? I loved how you did that before. And we went back to, like, 1928. What is the first action program, a Q game? Well... The last time we did that, we did it by, it was, it mentioned it in the thing. All right, year published. Yeah, and then you go to the last page. Oh. oh okay. I can't, We're still like, working out the kinks, folks. We'll get there. Year published. All right. Uh, Petia, this is negative 100. Um, <laughs> okay. So I never heard of So an antiquities it. game featured action programming. Let's see. It was. It's roughly translated as robbers. It's an abstract battle game played by the Romans. Uh, and you have different ranks wow. of pieces. Looks like chess. I don't know where the. I don't see this programming part of it. Eh, I'm not counting this. All right. All right. Let's go. So then, back. what's the next one? Well, Although I think you just found a new game for Restoration Games to get. Yeah, I'm get sure. The rights to. I'm sure he's taking notes. The problem is, is now we. I have to go through a bunch of games that have no year. Oh, here we go. The oldest year is Push M Up Slugger Baseball Game. <laughs> uh, here's a U-Boat, Go-Car, Nuclear War from 1965. Uh, you know what? I'm going Nuclear back Nuclear War is interesting. In the description, that's the one they use as the reference for a rolling cue. Which I bet you is the first and last example of that. And uh, Jeff was just so keen on nuclear war that he had to give it its own subcategory of rolling cues versus batch cues. But That's, I'm going to say, from the description of a rolling cue, I'm all about batch cues. I, I think I, I think I agree. Having to make those decisions up front and then living with them is what makes this mechanism so, well, not for Sam, but for... For other folks like myself, so much fun. Well, actually, you Sam doesn't always fun. hate it. He hates it in Robo Rally, but he didn't hate it in a few other games. Oh, okay. Now, now, Root is the next one on the list. Root has this in it, but only for one faction. Yep. And that's the uh, the birds. Um, the Airy. Airy, that's right. Yeah. And they're excellent. They are by far. I have played Root a couple times, surprisingly, and they were by far my favorite faction to play. That's actually um, my least favorite faction because I like... I don't want that rolling. I don't want that programming thing. I want to be able to do what I want when I want. Thank you. So. Oh, you know what? Hey, and they're an example of a rolling queue because the queue stays and you're updating it over time. You know, kind of modifying it as you go. It's brilliant. Um, and you're right there. I would think they are the probably, probably the toughest one to play because of that, because they require so much and it could just, I mean, it literally, it will literally blow up in your face. Your entire civilization will collapse if you cannot keep that queue trimmed and working well. Oh, man. The next one is Space Hulk Death Angel, the card game. And I like this game a lot. And I'd have to sit back and think really hard about where the queue part of it is. Because it's been it's, a long time. I don't think there is a queue unless you're playing at lower player counts. Because at lower player counts, a player has to take on control of several of the squads of Marines. So on my turn, oh, I control this group and this group. And I got to play a card for both of them. Whereas if you uh, if, if you're playing the full player count, oh, we're all just going to play one card and have you know our, our marines do one. So I think this one's pushing it as well. Although man, it's such a shame this is so long out of print. This is if anybody ever asked me, do I actually like Roll to Resolve for combat resolution? This is the game I point to because it's such a brilliant little co-op. My favorite part of this game is the fact that once in a while you draw a card and you have to make a decision without consulting the other players. <sighs> Why doesn't every game do that? That is so brilliant. I don't understand it. It's it it. I mean, yes, you say, well, that makes it less of a co-op. Of course, that that completely destroys the alpha gamer because you're like, I'm sorry, that's I had to make the choice. You, I wasn't allowed to ask you what to do. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I love it when I draw one of those. I love it when somebody else draws one of those, and I'm just sitting there waiting. What are they going to do? What is happening over there in that dark corner? Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, there's a top ten category for you. 
amazing mechanisms that games have not copied but should. Ooh, that is a good one. And this All is right. definitely a good one. All right, let's see here. We have Space Alert, which is kind of like a cooperative robo rally. Yeah. As you're all programming together, and it's in even real more. Time. It's even in real time. It's even more frustrating because you're you're probably going to play with someone who's not as good as you, and you're like, why did you not program this Indeed. properly? Look, you had one job: push the button. That's all you had to do. Walk to the right and push the button. Guess what, Rado? Here is another rolling cue: Mechs versus minions. Okay, I have to... All right. Dang it, Jeff knows what he's talking about. Apparently, it is enough of a thing. <laughs> Jeff has foiled us again. probably did to do a little bit more research than I did on this topic when it boils right down to it. But you're right. That's another... It's another good example, yeah. Yeah, Mechs vs. Minions, I like a lot because you, you, you start with this queue built and then you just kind of modify it and you'll think you have this perfect queue and then the whole board will change. Something will happen. And you're like, oh, now i got to change multiple cards. It's really cool. Yeah. Oh my goods! How does that have a cue? Um, well, I guess it does. I mean, because basically every round you pick, you have a card that represents you, and you say, "Okay, I'm going to work in this one building." And later on, you can get helpers, and that means, "Okay, I'm going to send myself to this building. I'm going to send my helper to another building." So I, it's I feel like it's kind worker... of, but not. It's it, it's it's tangential again. I think it's worker placement. It's just that your workers are cards. Yeah, and also. If I recall, I don't think there's any real timed resolution. I, I tell my workers where they go, but I could have my assistant go before me, I think. And so you're not really, I've made my choices and now i got to live with them. I think you still have some flexibility. Although flexibility, I think, I think that's a, a really great place for designers to play with this. Because um, when I looked at this list this morning before we got on, I was actually genuinely surprised there isn't a, another game at the very, very top of this list. And you'll tell me I'm crazy. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to say Gloomhaven is a programming game. Agree, disagree. Of course, very appropriate to talk about now since Frosthaven just launched on Kickstarter. Not that Isaac needs any kind of <laughs> shout-out from us. It's That's already true. over $2 million in Shh. its first hour. No, it, Look, if you hadn't said anything, you could have people would have went there and been like, wow, that show was so oh, popular. I it was it. $2 million. Oh, no. Um, let me see. Uh, well, you're playing two actions, right? Playing two actions. And the reality is, when I am choosing these two cards, it is fully with the intent of, I will do this, and then I will do this. If everything goes to plan, this is the program I've written for my character. How and often course, do you switch? Um, well, it depends on how good your partner is, when it boils right down to it. It depends on how good your communication is. If we can work it all out and the initiatives work out, and that's always the most tense moment if we're both kind of going at medium speed, and I can't tell you I have a, a 42 and you have a 43 and will we be able to do this properly? But that's the thing. Uh, because of the imperfect communication in that game, if we can get the idea across, yes, we have a perfectly programmed plan. And then the only confounding factor is there's another element, the monsters, who have their own set of programs that they're going to run. If you're running three different monsters, they... It, that's a program that gets run. Uh, you know, the sprites run at 22, and then the uh, dryads run at 32. Uh, okay. And then, uh, you know, I, I'd say that's programming all over the place, but it's programming that once you've chosen your program, the tools you've used give you a lot of flexibility to say, okay, my program is crap. I don't have to live with this. I can try to reprogram on the fly by changing the sides of the cards that I activate. And I would argue that's why it's a programming game, and it should be on the action queue list. I'm not completely sold, but I'm not opposed to either. Let me think. Dungeon Lords? This one is, uh, they run through your oh, yeah, yeah, dungeon yeah, yes. at the end. Yep, yeah, that's straight up. Got to play, I think it was three cards face down. Everybody reveals. It's, it's, it's basically like, well, like the very next one, Fresco. What you're really doing is choosing where am I sending my workers, and in what order are they going there. And if you end up getting to a space before I do, because you went to this space, you know, as your first action, I did my second, suddenly my plans fall apart because I really need to get first dibs on that tile. But you went there before me and you took it. So I, I would totally give it to Dungeon Lords, yeah. Okay. I know you weren't a fan, but I, I think it deserves it. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm a fan or not, depending on the, the category. Uh, Shogun here. This one... I don't know if you've ever played Shogun. I have never played it. We, we talked about it a bit with uh, 
uh, dice tower or you know uh, cube towers, but no, I've never played it. Yeah, in Shogun, you have different cards that you are going to different regions that you control, and then you put those regions in different things. Like I might tax a region, I might build a church in a region, I might attack with a region, whatever. Um, and then the queue is on the side. You see half of it, you don't see the other half. So it'll be like taxing happens first, and then building churches happens second, then attacking okay. happens third. And so you pick which thing goes in which ones, but you don't know what the last six are. Ah. So some of them are face down. So you don't know what every action is going to be or the first six. I don't know. S- some, several of the actions. Yeah. So it's like there's a programming track and everyone is putting things on it. I don't think – well, Mombasa – Mombasa's a – how is that a – Oh, man. What is it? The main thing I remember about Mombasa is you play cards and then they go into a queue and it'll take a while before you get them back. Yeah, I don't know if that counts. Yeah. Because if I've that's so, then, then Concordia I, would I count will that way. I will plead ignorance. It's been five years since I played it. And I'm going to argue against Not Alone. Not Alone, you're all picking a spot that you go to at the same time. That's simultaneous yes. selection. It is not action cue. Let me... Well, and unless you want to broaden this definition to say there is a concept of a communal programming. Because that's what, we're not alone, we're all simultaneously choosing our one line of code in the program that's going to run. The program being everybody runs to all these different locations, i.e. worker placement. Okay, but if that's the case, then I don't know. To me, that's fine, then you're making this a bigger category, and simultaneous selection is just a small subcategory of that type. Well, then I'm going to let you um, ch- uh, update the not alone database. Oh, entry, are you kidding? Already- I'm not... I'm not going in. I, there's, look at all these X-Wing Don't expansion packs. Don't you realize packs. if they accept your change, you get half a geek gold every time. You'll be rich. Yeah, Roll but I'm already, I'm already getting rich from the whole one geek gold I get for doing a 30-minute video. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm sliding down past a lot of this stuff, but Lords of Zidit is one that a lot of people don't know about. This is definitely a programming game where you're mm-hmm. going to program your actions. It's, it's very Euro-y. It's, I'm, I'm assuming you haven't played it. No, I have not. I think you might it's like this one. Three-player minimum. Three-player minimum. Oh, never mind. Yep. All right, jumping to the next page. Let me come down here. Oh, Room 25 has some programming. Oh, how it. dare you, sir? You skipped La Isla, which uh, is easily in my top ten Stefan Feld games. That is a brilliant little game, and the programming is strong in that one. Every card is a multi-use card, and you have to program based on I think it's three different attributes, and you put three cards into three slots, and and then and then you know, and everybody's doing it simultaneously. Everybody reveals their program, and it's an area control game where we're trying to do kind of animal conservation on this mysterious island. Oh my gosh, this is such a great game. Are you saying you have a problem with La Isla? I've never played it. I think you would enjoy it. I think um, uh, this I'll is not, I mean, th- this is definitely a much lighter game than what Steffenfeld is def- definitely known for. It You could almost gateway this. This is kind of a gateway plus for him. And, uh, you know, it's got charming animals. See. It's got a nice little modular board you set up every time. I, I think you would really dig it, honestly. I have to see if it's in the Dice Tower Library. I'm actually currently going through, like, holes. Like, yesterday I played Hadera. I've never played it before. Because uh, Z reviewed it for the Dice Tower. So I'm slowly catching oh, up on this stuff. Um, so I'll put that on the list. I don't know if that's in the Dice yeah. Tower library or not. All right. You won't regret it. Well, I don't know. That's a Rotto guarantee. Regretting it already. All right. <laughs> oh, Rotto guaranteed? <laughs> My guarantee has failed then, obviously. All right. Room 25. Um, that's sort of – that's programming for sure. You program – is it two or three actions? I don't. You probably not played this because again, it's not a two-player game. Oh. Yeah, it's exactly. like it's like Cube, the movie. You're inside this thing, and everyone's moving around trying to escape and not fall into rooms that are horrible. Yep. There's Wings of War, famous Aces. I mentioned that one. Right. Carson and City, that one which earned it, like you said. I'm pretty sure Carson City. The first time you played that, and last time you played that was with me. The last time I played that was with you, where, um, yeah, Jason just had it in for me. It was his goal in life to destroy the peacenik at the table and grind me into the dirt, even though I refused to, um, you know, duel anyone. Well, if it helps, at that point in my life, when you came, and I was like, oh, good. You know, I, I, this is what I honestly thought this. I was like, well, I know that Rado's wife does not like combat, so when he comes to our house, he gets to finally play combat games. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that is when I found out it was you who were the more exactly. the care bear. So Jen loves Tigris and Euphrates. As so, an example. Now now I know. Yep. All yep, right. Yep. Tiny and speaking epic- of Carson City, I think that's that one doesn't quite cut the it is not either. it's a worker placement game sorry it's I just a worker got... placement game where once everybody's done you kind of run a program and activate the workers in order Kalis style but is Kalis on this list i i think it would have we would have seen it by now so i'm gonna i'm gonna fix this don't worry tom <laughs> rada will fix it i'm glad you're on board well we only have a few more minutes to go through this because we gotta get to the next segment okay, move on, yeah. tiny epic max for sure is programming um have you played this one uh, I played a prototype of it early on. I thought, well, I, I didn't get to play it with all the really cool mechs where you slot the meeple into the mech and all that. So I, I think it seems to have more of a toy factor than anything else. Is why I, I remember not, of it. This one I've not heard of too much lately. Vasco da Gama, something like that. Uh, it's it's a, a little game. I, I think it did rise to prominence a few years ago when it uh, fell afoul of someone's roof. If that I recall. was it. I, no joking. That's literally a decade ago. This week. Wow. Are you going to do something special? No. <laughs> I've done enough. And besides, since that moment, Paul Omori has become one of my favorite game designers. <laughs> I think his stuff's fantastic. Uh, do you think that, there is not any that chance that because of your admission right there, that he's one of your favorite designers, that maybe, maybe in an alternate universe, if you were to go back, you could find yourself enjoying that game? It's possible. And it's more I, a reflection of where you were in your life at that time. That was the game. What I, you were I, looking for and I what just, you were railing against. Because uh, you love Lorenzo El Magnifico. If you love Lorenzo, there's no reason you shouldn't love Bosco. I don't think they're the same. But again, but, 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 yeah, well, it's they're, been they're a decade. different style of games. But they, they have that same dry, euroy. oh my gosh, this is an amazing puzzle. How can I get through this um, as I build an engine thing going on? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. And also, by the way, it doesn't belong here. It belongs here as much as Kalis <laughs> or um, what's it? Because again, okay. it's hey, we all just do our worker placement, and then our workers resolve in order. So that's like a that's like a whole different subcategory of worker placements that res- do not resolve immediately. Which maybe we'll get to when we someday reach the W's. I am actually speeding through here to look for games that do fit this category. I will stop and point out Robot Turtles. If you've never heard of Robot Turtles. It is a programming game for kids. It teaches them actual programming. Um, mm. it, but it, it's like a robo rally for kids. Really like this one. I'm just, this one made me happy because my kids played it. Yeah. I, I, I love that idea. Yeah. Is Otis a word? Otis has programming? Otis, you. Wait, but that's, the, that's the elevator game, isn't it? Yeah. No, the deep you know, sea no, diving. Again, I think that's, that's leaning. I mean, because they call this action cue. Any game that has any kind of cue suddenly gets this nod. Uh, I think this I is maybe agree. an issue with this na- nomenclature. Uh, because, yeah, Otis has a, a cue of actions, but it's not like they're all going to you know, cascade. It's I'm moving them around, but no, it is not what I would consider a programming game, um, which is in the way that Robo Rally is. Here's, oh, what I most, cool. here's what most people won't think of. Duel in the Dark. Duel in the Dark, the, the English player is flying a bomber into Germany, bombing it, and coming back. It sounds like a war game, but it's not at all. It's a deduction mm-hmm. game. The, the English player like builds their, all their cards. Then they build their whole flight pattern, and they make their cue. And then the Germans like set up their stuff and try to figure out where they're going to go. And it's kind of a fascinating... Uh, fascinating. I mean, it's, it technically fits in the category. Uh, you know what? I just went back and I looked at the uh, topic. I don't think you read the final sentence. Most of the time, players have their own cue of actions. However... Some games, notably Impulse, have a shared action cue that all players use. So, I have to rescind my um, trying to kill a couple of games from this category because they consider a shared cue, which really is just another way of saying worker placement resolution. I, so, I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, one of these days we're going to have to have Jeff Engelstein yeah, on this yeah. show and be like, why? You're wrong. All righty, well. <laughs> It's half. We're already halfway through the show, so we better jump to the top five. So All right, folks. Let's. And that's what's the category again? Was um, action Q. Yes, that was action Q. Hope everybody enjoyed. Here we go to the top five.
All righty. That was grandiose. Um, <laughs> I folks. haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the way this works is you guys give us a bunch of topics here. Top fives. Try to make them interesting, not like top five favorite games. And if you ask Desert Island, I'll never pick it. Ever. <laughs> Um, Dessert Island, on the other hand. Ooh. Well. So I'm going to pick four of them, and then I'm going to give them to uh, uh, Rado, and he'll pick one, and then we will together build the definitive top five list on It will it. stand the test of time. Your grandchildren's grandchildren will speak of this list in the future, <laughs> and, it, and the wisdom that was on offer from the two <laughs> titans of a board game. Uh, well, I'll, I'll stop. That's ridiculous. I was just trying to vamp while people, but I see the, uh, they're starting to come in now. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm writing them down as fast as I can. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Ooh. Okay. I got four topics. Okay. You can stop sending them in folks. All right, here we go. So one of them is the topic you already mentioned, although I'm afraid to do this one without people, without any research is the top five mechanisms. Other games. There's no need for research. You you only have one. Okay. Then the second one is dice drafting games. Mm -hmm. And then the third one are video games to board games. Oh, ones that have already made the transition. Yeah, like like it's a a board game based on a video game. And then the last one is the top five monsters in board games. Top five monsters in board games. All right. Monsters, video games to board games. Dice Could we amend games. that to video games that should become board games? Because I don't know if there are five that are worth calling out as, yeah, at this point. I don't... I'll I... let you think about that. Monsters. Oh, uh, dry Drafting. That's a nice, simple, straightforward one. And what was the first one? Uh, mechanisms that other games should copy. Oh, I do want to do that one, but you're right. Uh, it would then prompt um, five minutes of us just frantically searching board game geek. <laughs> I'd be like so going through my favorite games for now. and going. But which I do ones? want to hear it because I think that's a, fi- a fantastic topic. Um, let's see. I have to admit, uh, my my gut is to go with monsters. Uh, I mean, I might have gone with the video games if they were asking us to hypo- hypothetically say these are the game- video games that should become board games. Although that'd be a pretty straightforward one too. That'd be a lot of Final Fantasy tactics and type things. So I'm going to say monsters. All right, Top monsters. Top five greatest monsters in board game history. Whew. The amount of uh, people who sent in topics, though. Oh, my word. Thank you, everybody. They did not fool around giving us topics. All right. <laughs> this is from Marco Amatuli, who asked All this right, question. All right, Marco, good call. I'm going to let All you right. take the first one, Tom, because I really do think this is more in your wheelhouse than mine. There aren't very now, many uh, monsters in Steffen Feld and Uwe Rosenberg games, as a general rule. Yeah, but there might be. So I like to I like to think about them. Um, so the way this works, folks, is we can each pick. We have to both agree. Either one of us can veto the pick. So yeah, you know, maybe so someday might we'll, take- <laughs> it might take forever. Uh, my first my first jumping off point on this is is a monster that's straight up from Dungeons and Dragons. But that's only because this monster's on my head thanks to a certain movie that just recently came out, and it is in. I'm trying to think if it's in a board game. Yeah, it's it's Are you in. About uh, to spoil a movie. Ah, it's mentioned like at the very beginning of the movie. Um, uh, I didn't even say what movie it was anyway. Um, it's in Catacombs. The flicking game. Have you played that one? I played Catacombs. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so it's the. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I know what you're. I, it's it. it uh, it's kind of boxish. Yeah, the gelatinous cube, man. That's a- the gelatinous cube. Yes. <laughs> I, don't know. I am. I am. You, you, you nail this list. That might be the number one monster of all time, quite frankly. Uh, so weird and random. How did Gygax and company even come up with that? Right? I don't. I don't know. It just it cracks me Were up they because serving Jello at a D and D night one night, <laughs> and somebody said, "Wait a minute!" Or you know, it fell onto the map. I, you know, if that's not the origin story, it should be. That would be amazing. My personal experience with gelatinous cubes is actually in the video game realm. Uh, they had them in EverQuest. They were in, they were one of the first monsters you see in the in the sewers underneath Quainos, I think was the main city of EverQuest. And I remember going down and just being terrified. 
you know, because I never really experienced anything quite like that. You know, you know, there's real. If I die down here, my body is lost. I'll never find it again. That gelatinous cube is going to kill me and eat me and dissolve me. <laughs> oh man, that, and that keep was your so stuff. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I, 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 I approve. My actually, mm-hmm. I bought, and I'm ashamed of this, but when uh, that whatever that company is that made all those tons of uh, miniatures and they just sold them. Uh, what's that company's name? It was one of the first Kickstarters. I don't even remember if you remember that. They just sold piles of miniatures. Mm. Uh, and I, so I, I bought a pile of them for no reason at all. And one of them was a gelatinous cube, and it was like a clear cube, and you could take it apart and put a miniature inside it and then put the cube over the miniature. And I love that. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah, gelatinous cube, totally a winner. Oh, and, I, and I, one I'm of our... I'm having a hard time following that. Well, listen, one of, one of our uh, listeners said Gelatinous Cube is a playable character in Ex Libris. The library stacking game? Yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I, I believe him. Um, that, that does sound familiar, dimly. All right, I'm going to throw out the first one that I know you're going to shoot down, sadly, uh, because it's from Legends of Andor, your favorite game. Okay. No, no, actually, I don't remember how you think about Legends of Andor. I don't know how I, you feel about it. I thought Andor. it was very generic, but what's the, what's the monster? Well, okay, uh, I am choosing this less based on you know its iconic status and more on how much fear and terror it put into Jens in my life. Uh, it was I forget what they're called. They were or they were like demon dogs. Uh, if you're thinking Thundar the Barbarian, uh, they, they were kind of a, a demonic four-legged panther dog type thing. And, oh, uh, yeah, I do remember those. Yeah, and yeah, okay then. If you remember them, you know what I'm talking about. They are the most memorable thing because the whole point of Andor is you're trying to defend a central castle and all the enemies have these um, lines that they're traveling. They follow arrows to get there. And most enemies only move one space per round, but those dogs move twice. They were twice as fast. And the whole point of Andor is that the enemies can leapfrog over each other. So when one of those things comes out, you have to stop everything you're doing. Because they will destroy you. You will just lose in an instant because they are so fast and so terrifying. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 like I said, I mean, probably our most dramatic and exciting and tension-filled moments in Andor, which is one of our favorite cooperative fantasy games of all time, is because of those dogs, which have some kind of fantasy name. I can't think of the name. But, yeah, I, mean, I love them. I mean, they, they had a really nice character design, too. They kind of look like the aliens from Alien 3 when, you know, the xenomorph you know, it was birthed out of a dog. And yeah, they were very, very cool. Very scary for me. So you tell here. me, does Nobody... it, does it uh, pass muster? Yeah, why not? I'm in a, I'm in a really good mood here. So Wait, you remembered them, like you said. Well, so actually reminded me of something else. When you said something that scared me when it showed up in a game because of how annoying it was, I'm going to jump over to ghost stories. Ooh, okay, yeah. And so in ghost stories, the monster that, that I hate uh, is the... The Black Widow, because she steals one of your dice. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and okay, yes, yes, yes. And I mean, and, and that yeah, that's a death knell basically if you can't get that die back fast. There's also yeah. the one who has who has t- teeth for eyes, and that scares me just looking at it. But um, uh, let's see. Boy, people are giving us some comments here from the thing. I'm going to throw some stuff that people threw out here. So they, they right. mentioned the monsters from King of Tokyo. Some people. Yeah, I was just waiting for you to get. I, I was going to give you that one. I mean, that. Well, one I don't cool. know yet. I don't know yet if I want to put those down yet. Some people are being more literal, saying like Hitler from Black Orchestra. Um, oh, although okay. I would hate, to, I sure. would hate to put Hitler on a list, frankly. <laughs> um, the Dragon and Clank. Um, Let's see what the else. The dragon people... doesn't have enough presence to really feel. I mean, he's so laid back, that dragon. He really is. I think the one in Clank in Space is more. That guy in Clank in Space causes me more. I'm, yeah, I'm more I, afraid I agree, of him. Here's an interesting one. I, I don't know if you played Aliens and Escape from Outer Space. No, but I, I've heard you talk about it many times. I'm, yeah, I almost feel like I have. But that's like another player, not someone in the game. So let's see what else people have said. People are talking about the new King of Tokyo Dark. That's interesting. Shark from Jaws. I haven't played Jaws, have you? No, but I've heard it's great. That if you're a Jaws fan, you have to seek it out. Because one player is Jaws, one player is uh, Brody. And you know, all the roles are taken. And, and apparently it's a very good asymmetric uh, you know, team game. That, uh, but since neither of us played it, we can't do it. If I had played it, it might make it. 
I, I mean, what I want to do is I want to give some credit to Aeon's End. And, you know, as that game has gone on, I mean, because Aeon's End, every time you play, all you're going to do is just sit down and fight a boss. Every time, every session is sure. a boss fight. And those, some of the later bosses that have come out are so brilliant in their design. Like the one that actually, um, you know, forces you, you know, it, it, it controls time and forces you to age and uh, steals stuff. It, it does more than just the standard, oh, we're putting crap in your deck. You're, we're literally aging you out. And, um, oh, man, there's another one. Uh, from the most recent expansion, you know, uh, Aeon's End is a Dominion-style deck builder where you have all your decks pre, and that's how you build your decks. But this one boss steals all the cards from those decks, puts them in a queue, and suddenly turns Aeon's End into an Ascension-style deck builder. Completely changes the entire base mechanism of the game to fight this one boss. Do and you I'm remember? amazed. There's been so much cleverness and creativity with the bosses of Aeon's End. I'd have a hard time giving it to just one, though, because I've been really blown away by all of them. But we no, need that... one more. I do like the idea of the fourth one being from the from the uh, from the commenters because it takes a lot of pressure off of us. All right, all right. So where are we at? We have Jotinus Cube and Demon Dogs. Yes, we're at two. <laughs> okay. Um, someone said um, the Nazgul from Hunt to the Ring. Um, kind of hard not to. I mean, that's almost too easy because you could also say you know the Xenomorphs from any Alien game. Sure, and there's also you. I mean, we could just jump to Cthulhu himself. Yes. Um. Let's see the the different sin monsters from the others. Those are gross. The aliens from Death Angel. No, not particularly. I'm trying to think. How about the boss in Mechs vs. Minions? The one that, if I remember correctly, that Rado spoiled at one point. Was that you, or was it someone else? No, I think. Wasn't I complaining that you guys did? Or something I, like that? I don't remember. I think I showed, like, part of it or something. I don't remember. Yeah, I still, no, okay. But you know what? I'm going to give it to that it's one. Actually, it's actually bursting of out of the packaging. box. <laughs> I'm going to give it to it because of the packaging and the All presentation, right. which, of course, is... And, 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 hey, it ties with Action Cube because it's an Action Cube game. Won't spoil it again, but uh, there is a particular boss in that game that is just components wise the way the way you are introduced to them is so fantastic uh and is so memorable that i'd be ha i don't remember what the name of that monster is but i would give it to that one all right so we're at three now yes <laughs> there, there's so many good monsters here folks so i'm trying not to um try to pick one uh let's see the final enemy from Stuffed Fables. The the enemies in Stuffed Fables are very cool. Same the, with Aftermath. The giant but, Cthulhu from Death May Die. Um, see, you know me, what? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one out here. Um, the uh, it's the, the the very first the lion from um, Kingdom Death Monster. Uh, it's incredibly iconic. Everybody has to fight that lion. And really, what I'm doing is giving more props to, I think, the strongest thing of Kingdom Death Monster. The central mechanism for how monsters are controlled in that game is, when you set it up, you've got a deck of cards that represents everything that lion will do as it chases you down. And if I recall correctly, that card is kind of randomly generated from a bunch of stuff it could do. So every time you play Devil, uh, you know, uh, that uh, King of Death Monster, you don't know what lion you're going to fight. You don't know exactly what they're going to do. And in that regard, it feels more like an unpredictable, real monster. But what happens is, as you're fighting, every round he draws another card, does a thing, you start to learn what that lion will do. And you start to, okay, we can anticipate, oh, he hasn't done this particular move that's in his deck this time we play it. And the more you damage him, the more of those cards get pulled out. And that is such a brilliant way to thematically create a monster that has a real personality. And you could play Kingdom Death Monster a dozen times and fight a different lion every time. And so, like I said, I'm really giving a nod to the brilliance of that design mechanism that should appear in more games. There's another one that should be copied more often. Um, and, I mean, it's a really gorgeous mini. And it's, you know, it's, it's how they start that entire game. Anybody who's played Kingdom Death Monster has experienced that lion. And it's the first time you play, it's so shockingly brutal. You will not survive. You'll be lucky if one or two of you survives that fight, while the other ones are literally ripped limb from limb. So it's it's grotesque, 
and terrifying and brilliantly designed. So I'm going to give it to the, uh, was it the White Lion, I think, or something like that in Kingdom Death Monster. Fight me. Uh, I'll, I'm not going to fight you because I haven't played it, but I'll give that to you. I decide, I made my pick that I like to pick, and yeah. that is the Invisible Man and in Horrified because he's the biggest pain in the butt of all the <laughs> horrified monsters. He steals, he, your, he steals your stuff. Like he, okay. he goes around it. You've not played Horrified yet? You've got no, I've not. It, I've not. It's on I my really, list. It's on my list. There are too really, many games. There are? Are you sure? Who knew? Breaking it's news, funny. Tom. I was just saying the other day to, to Melody, I said, you know what? With us being at home, I think we can catch up on games. And then I looked at all the games in the shelf, and I was like, <laughs> what a foolish thing to say. <laughs> it will never happen. Can I have yep. a visible man? I'll give you the lion. I think so, yeah. I, I, right. I, I think... Um, so here's our definitive I mean, I list. We're giving it to him out of pure annoyance. If we want annoyance, then the fifth one is obviously the oozes from Gloomhaven. Those oozes yeah, are well, insanely uh, monstrous. Yeah, yeah, again, by, there's nothing more annoying in all of board game history than trying to fight oozes in the sewers in Gloomhaven. I'm still, I'm still picking it. And not that he's annoying. He's also scary because he's invisible. Okay, and, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we have Gelatinous Cube. Whatever the demon dogs are called. In Let's call them demon dogs. Demon, demon dogs. dogs in general are cool, but the, and or demon dogs. The unseen boss in Mechs vs. Minions. The Kingdom Death Lion, which is more than a lion if you see the pictures. And the well, Invisible Man. Saying, it's a monster. From Horrified. Yeah. All righty, folks. We're That's about five. to go. We've that done is it, five. We've made it again. We're going to go to questions. We have like 10 minutes. Here we go. All right. All righty, folks. It's time to ask questions. We got a, we got about 10 minutes, and then Rado's going to jump over to his other stream. Yep. Remember, folks, go to marvel.rado.com and watch me save the day. New York City is under assault. Mysterious mutagen has been released, and regular people are turning into goblin thralls. Can Captain America and Thor save the day? Tune in to find out at marvel.rado.com, which will be <laughs> what I do right after this. <laughs> By the way, I just saw in the uh, chat one more uh, for monsters: the rule book for first Martians. Oh, <laughs> Nasi might be watching. <laughs> Sorry, right. Nasi. What's your favorite Star Trek series? Uh, well, I mean, I'm a child of the 70s, so I have to go with the original series. I mean, everything I know about life, I learned from Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Uh, if it weren't for that really, really strong nostalgia, you know, part of my childhood thing, though, I might. It's too early to say. I think Discovery has the potential to ultimately, depending on what they do moving into this third season, which I won't spoil at all, uh, because hopefully, if, you're, if there's any chance, you should watch the first two seasons of Discovery because what's going to happen in season three, it has the potential to be so mind-boggling that I'm, I'm a, a Twitter with excitement. But uh, I heard that, that season heck, two oh, was... I could do a countdown for all of them. There's an easy top five. Well, yeah, no, we can't do you? top fives now. I haven't watched Discovery yet. Um, I like Picard a lot. I haven't finished it. But Picard is kind of a follow-up. I'm going to just have to say next generation because that's where i'm a child from you know next generation uh, hashtag not my star trek which we could probably argue about for half an hour i even. just love data and Worf. i really do <laughs> uh, next generation had amazing it had an amazing cast uh, amazing setup the thing is the first time i ever saw an episode of star trek next generation where there was some danger something was loose on the ship and they and mr Worf, see to it and mr Worf and two security guys we're very calmly walking down the corridor, very sedately, um, and you know. But the music was like dun 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 dun, and like do 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 do. It's just like all of the life and passion and 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 of, of Star Trek just bled out in that moment. You compare any scene of the next gen crew sitting at the conference table trying to figure out how to solve a problem compared to similar scenes in Star Trek the original series where Kirk is you know. No nonsense, you know, like very, uh, it's just like, uh, to me, they're night and day different. Don't get me wrong. I'm I mean, not, I'm not going to fight over this next one. Gen 2. I'm, uh, it's just next gen changed Star Trek I'm not, in a way that uh, didn't really work uh, for me. I'm not a strong enough person with Trek to, to have a fight oh, over I'll this go, one. I'll go, I'll go, you know, 
<laughs> all right. What are well, your what, first? What does Steve Rogers say? <laughs> what are I your? I can do this all day if you want to well, talk about Star Trek. Well, if we want to do Marvel, that's different. All right. What are your first impressions of each other's channel? I Going remember this time. I remember distinctly seeing Rado's channel and thinking, "Why doesn't he own a tripod?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, um, ah, because you used to zoom in and go back out. I guess I you do still now. Do I'm surrounded by tripods, Tom. <laughs> One, two, three, four tripods. I'm awash in tripods now. I'm finally, I finally joined the uh, 21st century. What do I mean? Gosh, what do I remember thinking of you? I, probably. <laughs> That's okay. You could be mean. I'm okay. Well, the probably the number one thing that pops into my head, just trying to look, walk backwards in mind, is, dude, and it's. I'm looking at the picture right now. What is with the neck beard? What is with the neck beard? There's no beard on the neck. It's on the chin. I don't understand why people say that sort of thing. I mean, you're not Amish. I actually, you know what though? And I know you can grow one of these. Actually, I, yeah, you know, I, I always went for. In my life, I just like to look distinctive in some way, so I shaved the, the mustache. So, and then I just I like doing that. I don't like the mustache. I grew it out, but it like got in my mouth when I would eat, and I just yeah, couldn't stand yeah, yeah. that. Yep, that's um, true. Actually, I normally trim this down, but I decided that until I can go back outside, I'm going to let my beard grow until it annoys me. Well, so we'll see what you know happens first. I, I, I had a similar resolution that lasted all of seven days. <laughs> no, that was that. Uh, already my hair, I said to my wife, my hair's already getting long. I need, I need, I need you to cut it. Yeah, I'm a bit um, out of control myself. i got to get this. But fortunately, my wife cuts my hair, so I'm, I'm, I'm totally set. Let's see. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. There's a lot of oh Kramer or Kiesling. That's a good question. Oh, that's uh, uh, Kiesling. And I, I, I hate to be just so dismissive, but I actually thought about this quite a while ago. Uh, I mean, I think they are at their best when they work together. I agree. It's something about the two of them. I, I think I can only imagine it's something to do with the fact that hey, well, no, we don't need that mechanism. And uh, Wolfgang says we don't need that mechanism. You know, because they just pair everything back to just this polished gem. Uh, you know, including Paris, which is on Kickstarter right now, their, their latest collaboration. Whereas when they are working separately or working with other people, their designs aren't quite as elegant, aren't quite as polished. I'll give the exception to Azul, because Azul is, what would Azul be if Wolfgang Kramer uh, contributed to that? I don't know. There'd be action points. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> there you go, yeah. I might agree with you there. I'm not sure, because I'm trying to think of Kramer's games by himself. Um, Kiesling did Coimbra, right? Was that him? Uh, no, that wasn't him. No, no, that's a couple of Italian guys. I'm looking right at it. Uh, Vigerino Gigili and Flaminia Brazzini, which is excellent. I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I don't blame anybody for giving it to Kramer solely because of famous area control game that I can't think of the name of now. That is... El Grande. El Grande, thank you. Yes, I mean... And, that's true. He yeah. also worked with Ulrich, um, Richard Ulrich, so... I used to think he was the – I would see both combos, and I'd say, well, the common denominator is Kramer. He's better. And then over the past three or four years, Kiesling has just burst out like a phoenix and just – my I word. And so, I, I do not want to take away from Kramer at all. No one can take away from Kramer because he will always have El Grande. And that, in and of itself, if he were a one-hit wonder, that would still put him in the pantheon. But, yeah, Kiesling scratches my itch. Um, and he's the one I'm really excited about. Nine times out of ten. All right. Adam wants to know, what board game artist is not getting enough praise and attention? <laughs> Vincent Dutre. The Miko. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> no, here's, here's one I, I think that people don't talk about her as much. Fernanda Suarez. She did the art on uh, Dead of Winter and stuff, but the one that really gets my attention is Ashes. It's a really mm. beautiful game. And uh, apparently she did some of the art for Century both Spice Road and Golem Edition. Okay. So she would be one that I would think of in that um, in that way. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, by definition, if they're not getting the recognition, I probably don't recognize them. Uh, but I want to say Andrew Bosley because I, I, I did not recognize his name at all. But then I saw Everdell, and Everdell is so right. gorgeous. And then I realized, oh, my God, this is the pandemic guy. He's the guy who does all the art for all the pandemics. And while I never uh, consider pandemic 
from an artistic point of view, after I saw Everdell, it made me really appreciate the artistry that's, I mean, because Pandemic is a game where you want the art to be nice, but you don't want the art to scream at you, look at me above all else. You know, it has to, and um, you know, so I, I'm going to give it to him because I don't think he's um, on anybody's tongue, but, uh, oh, and then Coimbra, that was the other thing. He did Coimbra's art. Which was so ah. bonkers. Nobody expected a Euro to look like that. I think I like his stuff better than his people. I think his people mm. are fine. Mm -hmm. But, like, Coimbra is great. I really like Coimbra. I wouldn't even guess that that was the same artist. I, 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 now I'm worried. I'm going to make sure about that because I've still got uh, Action Q opened up. I need to do an I mean, You can't do advanced search by artist. Let's just double check Coimbra because I'll be embarrassed. C-O-I-M-B-R-A. It just popped in my head because you talked about Coimbra earlier. All and right. I love that art. And no, I take back everything I said. Sorry, Andrew Bosley. I meant Chris Williams. Chris Williams. So Chris, Chris Williams. Chris Williams is a uh, Mr. Right. Pandemic artist and Coimbra and Azul. Oh, wow. So I'm looking through his list here. Actually, I'll just pull it up here on the screen so everybody can see it. And Arboretum. Um, Arpape Archipelago. Oh, Arboretum is amazing. Yes. I love the yep. trees in Arboretum. Huh. Yeah. And so, actually, right. I apologize. I conflated the two men, Andrew Bosley and Chris Williams. So I'll I'll, I'll split it and give to both of them. Wow, he's now, had now his I gotta look up make sure I was right about Everdale. Chris Williams. All right, that's a cool name. Yeah, so too. you you don't even recognize his name, and yet you have been looking at his art for years without even realizing it. What's fascinating is is that his name has Quill in it. It's like he was <laughs> born to be an artist. I, he had no choice. All righty. Well, I guess, right. unfortunately, folts, that's the last yes, question we're going to be able to I gotta, answer. No, i got to save New York. Ah, it's been done before. Uh, no, not this way. <laughs> uh, the big thing is I'm, I've been trying to convince Paul to play on expert difficulty because my wife, she does not. She always wants to play on standard, and we like win every time. I'm like, come on, Paul, we can do it, or at least we can go down trying. So wish me luck. I can convince him to switch it to expert mode at the last second. All righty, folks. Well, as always, we appreciate you watching. We're going to do this again Friday yes. on Rado's channel. Rado runs through at 2 p.m. on Friday. And yep. That's of course, 2 p.m. East Coast, 11 a.m. or West Coast. You're right. I'm sorry. East Coast bias. Um, he's doing a live stream right now. Later tonight, we're doing Dice Tower Chat. Come join us. We're going to finish this one. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Richard Rado Ham. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye.